Let's shift our focus to an equally dynamic aspect of our summit, the power of technology in fast tracking and informing food waste action. I'm excited to introduce our next session, Sign In, Sign Up, Technology Accelerating Food Waste Action. Facilitated by Associate Professor Simon Lockery, the Reduce Program Leader at N Food Waste Australia. In this session, we're privileged to first hear from the esteemed Dr. Ian Opperman, industry professor at UTS and co-founder of ServiceGen, and former chief data scientist for the New South Wales government, who will be providing insights into data, AI, and the digital economy. We'll then hear a dynamic panel of leading digital innovators who are at the forefront of harnessing technology to combat food waste. Joining the panel are Katie Barfield, CEO of Yume, Tim Brown, CEO of Gander, and Dr. Ian Opperman. Please join, in, join me in welp welcoming Assess Associate Professor Simon Lockery to open this session for us. Come on up, Simon. Good Hi. to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> great to see you. Thanks, Costa. Always great to bump into you, Costa. I think we talked about soil for a whole day uh, about 10 years ago at the Carbon War Room up in Sydney, and always lovely to catch up with you. So we've got a great session now, uh, as Costa said, sort of shifting focus to technology diffusion. But firstly, I also, you know, being a Melbourne person, we're at Na on NAM, uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, the people of the Woiwurrung and Boomerang uh, language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, on whose unceded lands today we conduct this event and the business that we're in at the moment, which is food loss and waste, reduction, transformation, and engagement, which we do through the CRC. And um, some of you may have heard me talk about this before. Um, at RMIT, we've done a very deep dive and personal engagement, each one of us, on what um, being on country and connection to people and knowledge systems uh, from an Indigenous perspective means to us. Uh, and you may have heard me talk about before about the seasons. So in Melbourne, we have six seasons. We don't have four seasons. Uh, and at the moment, we are in the wearing season. I think last summit, Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, we may have been in summer, which was a different season. So I am uh, creating a little bit new of new knowledge here today. We're in the wombat season. The wearing are the wombats. They come out and they start grazing in this season. We have more rain. It's more temperate. It's a misty type of morning you often wake up to here. And in terms of food systems, it isn't always a time of plenty in Melbourne. In fact, when it is not a time of plenty of flourishing food systems, the ferns, the fruit of the ferns, become the food source uh, for the people of the Eastern Kulin Nations. So I, I encourage all of you to engage more in Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous systems, uh, particularly around food systems, as that's the you know, the place and the space that we operate in. So today, as Costa said, we're starting with uh, an amazing uh, speaker uh, that has been very generous in uh, providing his time and his expertise uh, to us today to introduce this um, you know, really important and timely topic to a lot of people in the room operating in food supply chains, etc. So I want to introduce uh, Professor Ian Opperman and just briefly uh, talk about the fact that he's definitely a thought leader in you know, this area of data, AI, and the digital economy. He's a reg regular speaker on these topics. Um, he's the co-founder of ServiceGen, which helps governments accelerate digital service delivery. He's also an industry professor at UTS. From 2015 and 2023, Ian was actually New the New South Wales uh, government's chief data just flip this, scientist working within the Department of uh, Customer Service, uh, where he held numerous roles, uh, including chairing the New South Wales Government's AI Review Committee uh, and Smart Places Advisory Council. With a solid track record uh, of entrepreneurialism, business transformation and business growth through partnerships, coupled with hands-on can-do uh, attitude, Ian has almost 30 years of experience in the ICT sector and has led organisations and delivered products and outcomes that have impacted hundreds of millions of people globally. So 
Uh, without further ado, uh, can you join me in welcoming Ian to talk about technology diffusion? Thank you for that very kind introduction. Let me also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and let me pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I'm that guy that's going to talk about data. Uh, I'm that guy at the party that gets you in the corner and starts talking about data until you just begged for, to find somewhere else to, to go to or, or talk about anything else. For the last 10 years or so, I've been working with New South Wales government trying to address wicked policy challenges, problems that are complex, subtle, and ultimately have people's behaviour at their heart. Food waste is a wicked problem. It's massive in terms of scale. It's really, really complex, and it has a lot of people's behaviour at its heart. And all of the things we've heard about today are all good things to be doing. There are some really no regrets things that I've heard about today and seen outside. But the complexity of a systematic networked effect problem like food waste is something that doesn't just get resolved just by doing no regrets things. It really takes a much more systematic way of thinking about these, these complex problems. Over the course of the years, I've spent a lot of time working with New South Wales government on wicked challenges, domestic and family violence, children at risk of significant harm, a whole lot of infrastructure optimization, but also in my spare time I've been working with the international standards community around how we can have greater impact on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They've come up a few times today. They were set out in 2015 and described the way we want the world to look in 2030, an aspirational vision of 16 outcomes with indicators that we say the world should look like this, no poverty, but what we mean is this, this, and this. No hunger, what we mean is this, this, and this. Quality education, what we mean is this, this, and this. And then the 17th is partnership because no one gets to do these things alone. No one can do these things alone. And over the course of, of the years, I've tried to bring more and more data sets into consideration. Every data set is a point of light. Every data set is a way of seeing the world Every data set is imperfect. Every data set is biased. Every data set is incomplete. But if you bring tens or hundreds, in some cases even thousands of data sets to bear, it gives you a different way of seeing that problem. It gives you a different way of asking questions and a different way of understanding the journey of child, family, household, community, food, waste. And of course, what we discover very quickly is complexity. There's a project we did on childhood obesity, and the hypothesis was a sugar tax will fix childhood obesity. We started gathering data from many, many different parts of New South Wales government and beyond. We looked at some really good research and said, you know what, we think this is complex, and we think it's that complex. And that's an influence diagram of the different factors that really need to be addressed in order to genuinely address the issue of childhood obesity. And what tends to happen, at least in government, is people say, well, I just want to do this little bit of it. I'm health, or I'm transport, or I'm education. I just want to do this little bit of it. I just want to do something better. I want to get a better outcome for the world that I have control or influence over. But in practice, if you don't bring all the pieces together, the barrel doesn't hold water. If you don't squeeze the balloon from all directions, you, one little bit pops out somewhere else. And you wind up not necessarily getting the outcome you want. You might improve your KPIs for your bit, but if you're not also pulling a lever over here and a lever over there, you don't get the outcome you want. There was not a sugar tax imposed in New South Wales, but what we did demonstrate is there are some things that we can do to, when we find the on-ramps into this, this challenge and the off-ramps, there are things we can do to, to, to actually disrupt the on-ramps and amplify the off-ramps. Another project we looked at was the risk, children at risk of significant harm. When we were brought in, there was a review done that said 22,000 children in New South Wales in out-of-home care, they've been identified at risk of significant harm, put into a protective environment. It was costing the state a billion dollars a year and the outcomes were terrible, absolutely terrible. So we said, let's describe what we want. Let's describe the outcomes we want, which was actually really, really, really hard to do. We could say what we didn't want. It was very difficult to say what we did want. And we said, let's create life journeys for every one of those children in out-of-home care. Look at over 10 years, 22,000 now, 44,000 over the course of 10 years. Let's build life journeys for every single one of those children, connecting data from education, health, family, community services, and justice. 
And then let's link in 137,000 related persons as described by FACTS, Family Community Services, for those 44,000 children. And that's a real diagram of a relationship element, a relationship diagram for one of those branches of those 44,000 children. And what we realized is it's really complex. In fact, it's so complex that when we proposed doing it, people literally, literally laughed at the idea. They said, that's ridiculous. You cannot build life journeys for 44,000 children and connect related persons. We weren't sure how many related persons, but it was 137,000. And when we showed this complexity, people said, oh, yeah, I knew that. I knew that. And we realized that very often people are defeated by the complexity of the problem and wind up taking some really, it takes shortcuts because it's intuitively easier to say, yeah, I kind of sort of knew that than to say, well, did you actually know this is the life journey for this child and their family? This is the life journey for this child and their family. And if they come in through education or they come in through health or they come in through justice, they have very, very different experiences. And so what we tried to do was really understand those points of friction that led children towards or away from the outcomes that we were looking for, the outcomes that we were seeking. But defining what we meant was really, really important. And so I'm, I'm, I promise you I'm steering back towards food waste, but what I thought I'd touch on is goal two, zero hunger on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We know that we are halfway through, slightly more than halfway through that 15 year journey towards delivering on those UN Sustainable Goals we know that we are hopelessly off track in terms of achieving those sustainable development goals. And goal two, no hunger, there are about 10% of people in the world who are at serious risk in terms of, of food, food security. And that's incredible. It went up, of course, during COVID, maybe not surprisingly, but it settled down to about one in 10 people in the world live without food security <clears throat> in a modern world with so much waste. And partly the problem is, we don't know quite how to do what we're trying to do because it's never been done before. It's an aspirational state. We don't quite know what happens when we pull this lever. What is the impact in the real world? Because the real world is really complex. We also know that a lot of these different outcomes interact with each other. And without the data to show that journey of or that impact pathway of, it's really difficult to say if we optimize just for no hunger, what would happen to the other sustainable development goals? Or if we optimize for smart cities or optimize for availability of electricity, what's the impact on the other goals? And so part of what I've been doing, typically very late at night, which is why the diagrams don't look that good, is trying to understand <coughs> impact pathways. Are we directly impacting something? Are we enabling someone else to impact something? Or are we learning and observing and helping to advocate or helping to inform or helping others better to do what they do. And there's been some work done on impact pathways for things like educational outcomes. And we tried very, very hard to do impact pathways for areas around smart city and availability of electricity. Electricity helps a great deal for poverty and education, but it's difficult and it's often considered too difficult. Most of us have heard the expression, keep it simple. There's another S in there somewhere. Thank you. But the, my, the last couple of decades, I've been talking to people about deliberately recomplicating the problem just enough so we can do something useful. The problems we care about are infinitely complex, but somewhere just underneath that infinitely complex problem is a finite complexity problem we can push on. We can better understand. We can find those points of friction for the journey of child, family, household, community. Getting back to food waste. We've heard some pretty astounding numbers today. It's phenomenal. Which other $36.6 billion problem do we have that we are not adequately able to address? Put aside the NBN and some submarines. Let's not talk about those. <laughs> which problem do we have that's that big, which doesn't get the highest level attention from government? It was great to have Tanya Plebisek open the session today. Which area do we not have industry and government and universities and standards working together? How would you know how much of the potato was left in the ground? You define a standard for it and then you measure it. One of the things that's really difficult is when we don't have standards. It's really terrible when we don't know quite how to describe the same thing from different perspectives, from the perspective of the farmer, from industry, from a, a, a CO2 credit, or from a tax offset. 
if we can't describe one thing the same way, we really struggle. So standards really, really matter. I do a lot of work in the world of resilience, and we do recently looking at the world of, of telecommunications resilience. If you don't have energy, you don't have telecommunications. Fire and rescue really depend on communications during an emergency. Their view of resilience is different to the electricity world view of re resilience, which is very different to the telco world view of resilience. But it actually starts with describing what we want in terms of an outcomes framework. The goal of halving food waste by 2030, same time frame as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, is a great start. That's a real world outcome. And every single organization in this room could be thinking about what do we do directly, what do we enable, what do we help understand and inform, and how can we try, test, and learn together and then share what we learn. So it's really worth putting more time and effort into outcomes frameworks, especially if your challenge has never been resolved before, if it's never been solved before, if it's a wicked problem, it's really worth putting time into those outcomes frameworks and then localizing it for what you can do, what you can enable, or what you could better understand to help advocate for or to inform, and then build a framework to learn together. And the final two slides, I just want to talk about standards for a while, so if you could just ease back. I've been given an extra 60 minutes to talk about standards. <laughs> I'm a data guy, and I've been a data guy most of my life. There are standards that help us do data sharing, acknowledging the sensitivities, the commercial sensitivities, the other sensitivities of data, and also issues around personal information. Through what's called the Australian Computer Society, there are the data sharing frameworks which have been developed, which actually make the problem of what do I mean, how do I measure it, and how do I describe how to share it much, much more easy. And I'm delighted to say that those, are, those white papers are freely available. I'm delighted to say there's now two international standards which have, were published in April this year that Australia led the development of, which actually talks through how you get the data from A to B, acknowledging sensitivities and acknowledging issues of privacy. So all of that, it's not just about the standards, of course. Costa talked about the need for heart. We don't get anywhere if we don't care. But caring and describing things in terms of principles is not enough. There are some really, really excellent no regrets activities being discussed and described today. Some really amazing technology solutions being described and highlighted outside. But if we don't bring all the barrels, all the staves of the barrel together, it doesn't hold water. If we don't do more than go beyond the principles, it really, we won't get there. If we don't understand what happens and how many levers we need to pull at the same time and who needs to pull those levers at the same time, we just don't get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. And <coughs> I'm just uh, make our way to the stage. Thanks all for joining uh, today. It's fantastic that we've got such a you know, breadth and depth of expertise on the panel. Um, so, I mean, we've had sort of the big picture there from Ian uh, and then sort of drilling down into some of the weeds that relate to the food system. And I think, you know, in Food Waste Australia, the CRC, our uh, industry action teams, all of our industry, government, not-for-profit partners are really grappling with rapid technological change, dealing with new data systems, dealing with AI, dealing with cyber security, dealing with also a lot of opportunities uh, for change and for optimization and for transformation, frankly. So, you know, there's a lot to unpack in this space and we're not gonna get through it in 15 minutes and 18, <laughs> 17, 16 seconds, but we'll try our best. So. Um, we're going to uh, go through a few questions first, and then uh, hopefully you'll have some questions that you already have or popping up as we're discussing uh, these issues. Make sure that you use the app to uh, add any question that you might have, and we'll try and get to those in the session as well. But um, I wanted to start, uh, Tim, uh, with you, actually. Um, so what, from your perspective, do you think you know, the business imperatives are uh, for technology and data in solving the issue of food loss and waste. And maybe at the same time, if you could just briefly talk about Gander, uh, yeah, your absolutely. technology. Thanks, Simon. So look, Gander is in 
short form a um, SaaS based platform and online app, um, a smartphone app that in real time receives um, information from supermarkets when they mark food down. So consumers can jump on at any time, um, geolocate, find their local store and what markdown items they have. So for example, you're about to drive home, jump on, oh, there's an eye fillet steak half price, I'll pick that up, purchase it, save the waste, save money, everybody wins. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to work with CRC for some time. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to um, uh, work with Simon, the RMIT, uh, uh, Alistair and the, uh, the uh, team at RMIT that have been fantastic. And not to steal uh, Kevin's thunder tomorrow, who's doing a presentation on Gander, but what we've actually realised through this process, we got into this, uh, getting back to something that Craig said this morning, about the um, money versus you know, the societal need. Uh, we got in this at, for, from a sustainability point of view uh, before the cost of living crisis hit. But what RMIT have actually found through their studies is that we've actually changed where people shop, we've changed how people shop and what they're feeding their families through being able to get fresh, uh, fresh things from the deli that they wouldn't have had previously because they're finding things discounted. That you know, fresh barramundi that kids that have only ever eaten fish out of a packet are, are trying and, and experiencing. So it's been really fulfilling in that respect. But when it comes to your questions, I'm going to think largely the challenge is the first mover piece particularly the bigger end of town everyone's a little bit scared to dip their toe in the water and actually give things a go to fail fast which is what we do in tech and to innovate mm. beyond the walls of their own test environments mm. um, what we've been really fortunate is a lot of the independent supermarkets the mum dad guys that have been owned and operated for some time they're, they're the ones that are actually dipping their toe in the water and experiencing the benefits so we've got a one group that wasted about a million dollars worth of food every year, uh, family owned. We've, in the last 12 months, saved them 25% of their food waste in their first year. So that's a real dollar, dollar figure and, and people are saving money by shopping from them. So that's a bit about Gander. Yeah, sure. Uh, and some of the business imperative, I suppose, context mm -hmm. as well in terms of experiencing it on the ground. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Katie, did you have any perspectives on that um we've had a really similar experience yeah. um you know we we work with b2b so yumi is a platform uh for the sale of surplus food we work with manufacturers across australia so one of our clients was up here today one of our users um we've got simplot in the room obviously goodman fielder this morning and sodexo so they were both up here this morning with buyers and sellers from the platform and what we do is as product gets is surplus for a number of different reasons people often jump to its end of life um, or it's you know it's, it's close to code that's not the case on the Yumi platform it can be um, promotions that have been pulled from shelf it can be MPD that didn't quite work it can be misforecasting it can be an imported product yeah. that by the time it gets to the water the forecasting's changed it lands they've still got to do something with it so that product comes onto the Yumi platform in real time and gets pushed out to a whole raft of different business buyers so if you've been in a Qantas lounge you will have eaten Yumi food yeah. um, and they take opportunities to purchase really great quality product at a much lower price um, to date, we've managed to uh, return $25 million back to Australian manufacturers um, to the tune of nearly 10 million kilos. Um, and we've, the challenge, the opportunity, but also the challenge, we have an opportunity which is there is what we thought would be a really sophisticated system at the manufacturing level turned out not to be when it comes to clearance. It's only 2% of their overall turnover. Um, so it hasn't got the attention that we believe it deserves, but I completely understand why it hasn't because, of course, they're focused on the 98% of product that they want to mm -hmm. sell through to their primary customers. But the challenge we face is it's B2B. So when you're looking at iterating and you've got to iterate fail fast, it's a long sales cycle yep. on B2B, so I really relate to what you're saying. Sure, yeah. sure. But it sounds like that there is momentum once the value of the business proposition is, is clear, right? We'll talk about mm. that more mm. in a second um, with some of the other questions. So um, sticking with you, Katie, uh, I mean, we, uh, Ian's framed, you know, and a few other people have framed this as a wicked problem. Um, and it's a big opportunity as well, really. Uh, so, you know, in, the, in those kind of contexts, collaborations and partnerships are really key. You can't do it on your own. Uh, it's, it's complex and we have to embrace complexity as Ian talked about. Um, so, you know, how is collaboration and how are partnerships playing out in the kind of technology diffusion that you're involved with with Yumi? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Yumi was built on 
um, collaboration and partnerships. So um, first of all, we thought we'll, we'll build something that looks a bit like this and they will come. And then we're like, no, that's not the right way to do it. We'll actually go and partner with industry for industry. Mm -hmm. And so we were really lucky that uh, General Mills, Unilever, um, it was Kellogg's as well, and Mars Food um, really opened the kimono and let us have a look at what was going on at the end to end clearance process for the end of life of product or where it's surplus. Um, and they were so transparent with us. And that helped us understand the complexity mm. of that part of the system um, when it hasn't gone through to the usual channels. Um, and from that and with them and in partnership with them, we were able to develop something with them that could then universally be offered out to the whole of the industry. Um, mm. So we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't be able to have those figures of return that kind of uh, money to Australian manufacturers if they hadn't helped us co-create it. It's as simple as that. And, sure. you know, we continue that in our daily work. Um, save Fuller in the room. We're doing a, uh, we're, we're going to be doing a round table together there. Um, talking to Chris from Refresh, who's here. We're like we're kind of selling to the same buyers how do we get together yeah. and fast track this so that we can move more product away from waste and into the system so it is an absolutely integral part of everything we do sure i mean ian you've seen you know complex problems over and over in your your time in the data and the technology space is this, this is a common theme that you see that these co-creation these collaboration aspects are just central and key it, it doesn't work without co-creation and partly it's because uh, there's there's always misaligned interests in, in a complex system which is probably part of the reason in most cases why they exist if you can't design a solution where everyone can see their own value proposition mm. in there you've got no chance whatsoever so it's it's really important but it also helps design better solutions because yeah. rather than just thinking about the world from your perspective you're forced to consider a whole lot of other perspectives sure cool um dialing back a bit and maybe you know, again, in your wheelhouse, I suppose, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of these um, you know, current and precedent uh, technologies that are seemingly all pervasive uh, and you know, clearly something that um, you know, industry governments have to take note of. What do you think are the key technologies or disruptions in technology that are going to affect food systems in the next, say, five years? Ian. Oh, <laughs> I was waiting for someone else to jump in front of that question. Uh, well, again, I'm, I'm very, very biased. It, it always starts, it starts with understand and understanding where you want to go. That's the design solution, but also being able to better sense and understand what's happening in the system. It, it, the food is, of course, it's not just the commodity that comes from the paddock to get to the plate. There's a whole lot of other industries that come together in order to facilitate that. There's, there's transport, there's logistics, yeah. there's, there's finance. And those sorts of, of, of elements don't work that well together at the end of the day. So believe it or not, I'm going to say blockchain. We'll throw a blockchain yep. out there, see if anyone <laughs> responds. I think blockchain has a real role for not only... The, it's been experimented with for logistics, but I think there's a lot more potential to actually follow the digital twin of that thing as it moves around, whether that thing is the whether it's the steak which is which is currently on, on on special as you drive past and all the services you can wrap around it or whether it's the digital twin of the financial model mm. of of the farm or the financial model of the producer so I, I think increasingly we're going to see digital twins underpinned by long chains of provenance which look like blockchain technologies mm. and lots more sensors out there sure sure and i mean are there are there real sort of i suppose dangers to the technology technological changes that are coming I mean, we saw last week that airports shut down sure. because of one patch that got rolled out <coughs> by one company in the us so apart from the really obvious concern about cyber security there's there's some different ways we need to think about how we use the technologies we keep creating honeypot data sets we bring all the data sets together and then we ask you to credential against it and then, then there's this beautiful attractive data set for someone else to come and knock over we need to think about virtualization of data. We need to think about data fabrics and, and that, that issue of the data always stays over there, but I can run my analytics on it or I can ask a question of it without actually seeing the data. So cybersecurity is a big issue. Privacy is another big issue. Yep. Once we talk about hyper-personalization, there's a whole lot of information about me and my preferences and my location and where I'm going that I inadvertently share with another system, much like we do with mobile communication systems. So privacy is one of the big, big issues we need to think about. We need to preserve that when doing these hyper personalized transactions sure tim did you have any thoughts on um you know what technologies you see gander uh, potentially having to deal with collaborate with 
Yeah, absolutely. So we've been fortunate enough to, in the UK, just do a deal with a company called Olio. Um, and mm -hmm. so they're a, um, a, a great sort of augmenter of um, charity uh, volunteers <coughs> and, and, and so to redistribute, um, you know, the, the items that are coming close to, um, close to use by date more quickly and more efficiently, I think is great. And we look forward to obviously doing that here in Australia with all the food charities. But also from another perspective on a global level, we're working with Google and their local inventory management systems or local inventory marketplace. So that is that, again, we're talking about this, this granular look at trying to create a marketplace within your local catchment. So Gander already, we work with all your meta and these sort of guys to really, around every store that comes on, we do social media marketing around food waste, around sustainability specifically. So nothing to do with your promotions, just about you know, the ESG side. But then with this new partnership with Google, what you'll start seeing is rather than seeing paid ads popping up, you're going to start seeing what's local and what's actually more efficient for you to purchase as a consumer, both from a cost perspective, but also to, you know, to aid food waste. So that's a very exciting thing we'll be working to roll out in Australia over the next few months. Sure. Sounds amazing. Um, going back to collaboration and partnerships, but maybe on a different tact in terms of the human side, the people. Um, you know, with collaboration, with action, you know, there's power structures, there's people, there's agency, agency of humans and non-human agents as well. Um, how do you think those factors uh, are enabling technology uh, to flourish for food loss and waste reduction? Katie, did you have any perspectives on that? For me, it always comes down to the people because, yep. um, you know, we couldn't do what we do without the amazing entrepreneurs within the companies we work with. It's always someone agitating for change. Mm. It's always someone pushing that extra mile um, that they don't necessarily get paid to do um, in order to get a, a new technology like Yumi in front of the right people. So mm. we're forever grateful to those people. But I think it's, you know, where we see... Um, the Yumi um, solution being adopted most readily is where it's a real top-down approach. You know, you've, it's coming right from the top, it's running right through the businesses. There are even KPIs set against reduction of, um, of food waste, um, where people ultimately will work towards their KPIs and those key objectives. So if what we do also see on the other side of it is whilst that works beautifully when they're embedded, if they're not, and let's say you have um, margin as one of your KPIs, right? You're in sales um, and you have a situation, this, is, this has actually happened for us, um, where you'll get a consignment of product that'll hit the platform, we're able to sell it, or if it doesn't sell, it can go through to donation. We have a technology that does that as well, that works with the food rescue organisations to ensure that no good food ever goes to waste. Um, but what we found is where obviously margins, and that is a really important part of manufacturers' jobs, you know, um, they're in it to create products that people love to consume and make money and get great brand awareness. But if it's all margin, then what happens is we've had a situation where we've sold it, but then they haven't released it. They've chosen to destroy it. Now, that might seem like complete madness. Mm. It is complete madness. But when you actually look at it through the eyes of um, particular companies, if you're if your discount budget has been used up because you don't want to cannibalize your margins anymore and your donation budget has been used up, then, and your landfill hasn't been used up, there it goes. and your KPIs yeah. are reliant yeah. on that, mm. there's the kind of cause, that that's the kind of thing that we have mm. to combat and it's really, really challenging. If I could just chime in on that, we're talking about that outcomes framework. That's why it's really important to, to be very careful about what you measure and also look sure. at the different mm. real world outcomes because that's an example of, of three different sub outcomes to support the profit maximization or the benefit of the organization. And if you don't really carefully understand those, you can have these really adverse outcomes. Correct. Sure. We, we had an interesting um, scenario happen with one of them, uh, with a major independent retailer that approached, uh, we spoke with them 12 months ago and they said, yeah, look, we're interested, but we've got other projects that were priorities, what they're working on now. Interestingly enough, they called me back to the table just last week and we're you know, in the process of, of working with them now. And the reason was that their tobacco sales had dropped so much that their business had to do a full root and branch review on where other opportunities lay to make profit from somewhere else. 
So my point being on this, it's not always, unfortunately, the sustainability side of the business yep. that's going to drive the change. In yep. this case, it's the fact that illegal tobacco has driven a business need, and that's mm. brought us to the table on potentially solving some problems throughout the, uh, the process, which is great. Yeah, again, demonstrating Ian's point that complexity mm. and the external complexities yep. there are driving the change, but you know, there's an opportunity we'll that, take it, yeah. that you'll take. Cool. Okay, um, I haven't actually got any questions from anyone yet. Um, did anyone have a question that we could get a potentially a roving mic to at all? Ask Ian a question, I dare you. <laughs> I, I can tell you about my favourite standards. Yeah. Like. <laughs> I can't see anyone else. We have someone at the front. Sure. <coughs> How do we fix silos? So uh, <laughs> the outcomes are actually a really good way to do it. Uh, it where New South Wales, if I could just put my yes to me hat on, uh, where New South Wales was going was customer centricity, trying to be the most customer centric government in the world, yep. really meant it. And so we changed it from being, you're dealing with health, you're dealing with education to you're moving to New South Wales, birth of a child journey, death of a loved one, getting a job. And what it meant was that silos are actually useful as long as the silo stacks are pretty low and or if you could drill through them. So if you could drill through them and connect up those pieces, it's really powerful. That point I raised earlier about resilience, energy companies <coughs> will not share data with each other about outages. Mm. They just won't do mm. it. And very often, it's, that's not what we want. We just want a better understanding of which part of the network is still viable right now. So sharing data differently doesn't mean I give you my data because it's sensitive or I'm concerned. I let you ask questions of it, which, which I approve the question. That's, the, that's partly the way that we've been trying to address that issue of getting through the, the silo, at least from a data perspective. Sure. I think we've heard in previous summits and CRC conferences, you know, stories about data sharing that just wasn't possible uh, prior to, you know, projects around food loss and waste occurring. Were there any other stories that you had around data sharing that... It wasn't so much data sharing, but I think it's conferences like this and other mechanisms that, I mean... You know, I've come from a you know the, the supplier side um, and and that very corporate dog eat dog sort of world, and and um, you know uh, unlike the, the example before where all the the Lamb Western um, competitors are all sharing their data in a platform, I mean that would be unheard of with a lot of the the companies I've worked for. But if we can get over that hurdle and start working together, these problems can be solved holistically. And I think you know, for example, we've we've discussed things that we can help each other with now. We're two parts of the same problem, and then we're talking to guys outside. It's too good to go. Same sort of thing. We're all we're not competitors. We're actually all trying to solve a problem. If we collaborate, not collude, it you know we can really get through this. I think that's a lovely place to leave a panel on technology and data. A very human ending. So thank you, Tim, for that. Sorry. Thank you, Ian, <laughs> Tim, uh, and Katie. Thank you all. Uh, and we will now move, I think, to a break. Can you thank our guests? Thank you, Simon. It is a break. Was I wrong? Was yeah, yeah, yeah. It is good. Yeah, yeah. I didn't stuff up. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it just keeps me on my toes. Um, Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Ian, uh, Katie, and Tim. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Ian, very often people are defeated by the complexity of a problem. <laughs> that was a very fair point. But uh, defining what we mean, that's definitely what it's about. And uh, I think at this stage, afternoon tea will define how we feel. Uh, more to the point. Uh, what a great discussion we've had since lunch, exploring these challenges we face into the future, uh, understanding how comprehensive strategies can amplify our impact, and then explaining how technology is revolutionising our approach to food waste. It's clear that collaboration and innovation are key to advancing our goals. As we gear up for our final session for day one of this, the 2024 National Food Waste Summit, time for a break, enjoy afternoon tea and uh, continue to digest these insights um, from our uh, speakers. And if you haven't, make sure you have a little look around at the trade show for all the different solutions that are being shared and we'll see you back here 
Uh, oh, actually, just before you go, uh, N Food Waste Australia would like to again take this opportunity to thank our event sponsors and especially the principal partner, Coles. Thank you very much. And we'll be back in 25 minutes. Enjoy your break.